Uh, hello, it's very nice to have a chance to talk to you all today. Um, I'm Xandra Brakefield and Edwina Abu Hadar will also be talking to you about our work on developing gene therapy for tuberous sclerosis. We're at the preclinical stage now, which means that we are testing it in mice first. A part of this work we're doing um, with support from Bridge Bio, which is a biotechnology company that's interested in um, helping to support this work. So what is gene therapy? Um, it's really replacing a missing gene uh, in the body and it can be done in two ways. In one case, you remove cells from usually the bone marrow of the, of the patient and you get the hematopoietic stem cells so they can continue to grow and divide. You modify them outside the body either using DNA, RNA, or vectors so that they now express the missing gene. And then you put them back into the person's body and they take up residence and usually they can keep dividing and delivering the normal protein back to the body. The other way is called in vivo. In that case, you use viral vectors with adeno-associated virus vector being the most common one used. Um, and you put your gene inside this capsid or you can put your gene inside uh, lipid nanoparticles. Those are injected uh, either into the bloodstream or into a particular part of the body, and they will deliver the gene to a subset of cells in the body so that they restore normal function. So this is an adeno-associated virus. Here is the wild-type virus on top, and below it is the vector. So for the wild-type virus, it's a very non-pathogenic virus, very small. Um, it depends on other viruses to replicate, and it exists in the host cell nucleus, but doesn't integrate into the host cell genome. And that's important because viruses that integrate can cause new mutations and uh, damage to the genome. And there's no disease associated with this virus. What you do to make a vector is you basically take out all the viral genes and you put in your gene of interest under a promoter that's gonna be active in the tissues that you want it to be active in. And then that, the only viral elements it contains are these inverted terminal repeat elements that don't code for anything, but they allow the, the strand of double strand of DNA to be incorporated into this capsid, the AV capsid. So these vectors are good for gene therapy because they lack pathogenicity, they can't replicate, um, they can achieve long-term ex expression in cells in in humans and mouse and mouse models. Um, that depends, though, if the if the cell is dividing or not. If the cell is dividing, it can lose these sequences. But non-dividing cells retain them for years and express. You can have different types of capsids that have more affinity for certain tissues than others, and there's low immunogenicity. Overall, however, once you do apply your gene therapy vector, the individual will develop antibodies to the capsid. And then after that, it will be difficult for the capsid to be very efficient at affecting cells in the body. And there's a lot of work going on in for different types of diseases using these AV vectors. There's two uh, FDA approved drugs, as it were, that, are you, that have been uh, taken into the clinic. One is for uh, a type of blindness. It's injected directly into the eye and it improves sight in the patients and it also um, reduces further blindness. Another one that's uh, in clinical or is used clinically is for spinal mu muscular atrophy. And that's basically helps the motor neurons to survive. And it's given very early in life, usually before two years of age. And those patients who would have, for instance, never, for instance, never sat up or even walked are now, you know, at the age of five, climbing stairs and running around. So it's really been remarkable, successful. In our studies, um, we've explored the use of the AV9. That's the same vector that's used in those cl clinical, clinically. And we've evaluated its ability to transduce different cells in the mouse brain after injection into the bloodstream. And we, what the gene we express is a fluorescent green protein so that we can see in the cross-section of the mouse brain here, 
that we're able to label or deliver the gene to lots of cells in the brain and many different types of cells, including astrocytes, um, neurons, et cetera. Now let's talk briefly about tuberculosis disease. As you can see in the diagram, it's an autosomal dominant uh, disease. The unaffected children of an unaffected parent and a TSC patient will inherit two copies of either TSC1 and or and TSC2 genes. The affected children have a 50% chance of inheriting one bad copy or of, of the TSC1 or TSC2 genes. The other copy will undergo a damaging mutation randomly in susceptible tissues during development and throughout life. The timing and the tissue involved in the second hit is random, hence the variation in symptoms and severity among patients. TSC1 gene encodes for the protein Hamartan and TSC2 encodes for the protein tuberin. And Hamartan and tuberin work together to regulate cell division and growth in the body. Any dysregulation or uh, any damage to either one of these proteins will lead to the cell proliferation and the cell increase in size. Now, tuberous sclerosis affects almost every organ system in the body. We have the hamartomas, which are benign growths, and these are made up of an abnormal mixture of cells, and these may grow in the brain, skin, heart, kidney, liver, lungs, and affect the function of these organs. Now, in the, in the neurology department, we're mostly interested in the manifestations of the disease and the brain. And we know that almost 95% of the patients have some, some sort of CNS involvement of the disease. TSC patients develop cortical tubers, as you can see in the first pictures on the picture on the left. And these are undifferenti undifferentiated or dysfunctional cells that uh, are found in the outermost layer of the brain, which is the cerebral cortex. We also find in these patients the subependymal nodules, which are benign tumors that grow around the ventricles of the brain. And if they grow enough, they become subependymal giant cell astrocytomas, as you can see in the middle figure over here. And these segas can obstruct the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain and can cause hydrocephalus. And uh, some of the neurodevelopmental manifestations of this disease would include severe refractory epilepsy, hydrocephalus, as well as autism and cognitive impairment. Now, our strategy in the lab is to shrink the brain lesions using gene therapy. And what we do is we use the AAV vector and we insert inside the genes, either Hamartan or tuberin, TSC1 or TSC2. The DNA for Hamartan is small in size and can fit perfectly into our AAV vector. The size of tuberin is a, is a bit big, so we had to make some accommodations and we had to condense the size of the DNA to make it fit in the AAV vector. And this is why we call it a condensed form of tuberin. And this uh, AAV vector that now has our gene of interest, Hamartin or tuberin, will then be delivered into the bloodstream and then will express the, the gene of interest that we inserted inside. In the lab, we have uh, mouse models for TSC1 and TSC2. Here I will be explaining the TSC2 model that we use. We have the mice that have been uh, developed uh, as such, the TSC2 gene is flanked with sequences on both sides. And whenever we express an enzyme called Cree recombinase, this enzyme will act on these uh, sequences and will flux out or, or will remove the TSC2 in a subset of cells. And the way we do it is using an AAV Cree vector. This vector is, will be injected into the ventricles as soon as the, the mice are born at day zero. And this vector will express the Cree recombinase enzyme that will flux out the TSC2 and different cells of the brain of this mouse. Then at day 21, after the birth of these mice, we will inject the therapeutic vector, which is called the av 9 c tuberin. And we will do this uh, into the blood vessels behind the eye of the mouse and this procedure is benign. It will not harm the eye of the mouse and will not cause any pain. And this is how we uh, give the gene replacement treatment to the mice. Now, uh, 
looking at the survival analysis, we have here different mice groups with different treatment conditions. And if we look at the graph over here, for all conditions, we start at day zero with injecting the AAD Cree to express the Cree recombinase enzyme and to flux out or to remove the TSC2 gene in a subset of cells in the brain of the mice. Now, in one group, we did not give any treatment. And as you can see in the black curve, these mice died with a median survival of 50 days. At P21, one group received Everolimus treatment, which is a repelog that is used clinically to treat TSC patients. And we've given Everolimus over the period of two weeks from day 21 to day 56. And uh, we can see that it increased the median survival for up to 74 days. But as soon as we stopped the injections of Everolimus, the mice also started dying, as you can see with the pink curve. The last three groups, we gave the uh, therapeutic vector, the aav 9 c tuberin at day 21 also. And we can see that when given the middle and highest dose of the vector, 75% of the mice were uh, survived for up to 150 days. The, deaths of, the death of the mice that did not receive the treatment was most, more, mostly, most likely due to hydrocephalus and seizures. In this figure, we're looking at the cross-section, coronal cross-section of the mouse brain, and particularly, we're looking at the lateral ventricles of the brain. And this experiment involves some staining to look at the proliferation of the cells in the brain of the mice. And this is how the, la the normal lateral ventricles of the mouse brain look. And as you can see, this is the normal ependymal layer that is lining the ventricles. And on the inside, you can see the choroid plexus. The mice that received the AAV Cree and where the TST2 was knocked out, we can see an increased proliferation of the cells surrounding the lateral ventricles. And these are called the ependymal and subependymal cells. We can also see the formation of nodules um, on, on, the, on the edges of the lateral ventricles. But when we give the treatment, at day 21, the therapeutic vector, the av 9 c tuberin, after a few weeks, we can see that the layers around the ventricles go back to normal and the cells normalize and they stop proliferating as uh, in the disease form. Here, we're also looking at coronal sections of, of the mouse brain and we're doing another type of staining also to check for the proliferation of cells. And as well, we're looking at the lateral ventricles of the brain. This is how the normal brain of the mouse looks, the normal lateral ventricle of the a mouse looks like. And this is the choroid plexus in the middle. We can see that we have little to no staining around the layers of the ventricle. But in the mice where we injected the AV Cree and we knocked out the TSC2 gene, we can see that the cells started to divide and they're going through an abnormal mitotic activity and they're going away from the ventricular zone, as you can see here with the yellow arrow. And it's also shown in figure C right here. And whenever we give the treatment at day 21 and after a few weeks, we can see that the layer normalizes and the cells stop mitotically dividing and proliferating around the ventricles. So we're very excited about this new approach for um, therapy for tuberous sclerosis. As we mentioned in the beginning, these AV vectors are used successfully in a number of clinical trials, and they're being tested for a number of different inherited diseases now. It's a single dose injection, um, it can be minimally invasive, for instance, going into the bloodstream. And yet, if you go through the bloodstream, you can still access and uh, replace the gene in neurons in the brain. And in contrast uh, to this kind of single dose of effect, if you use rapalogs, they require continuous treatment and there's reduced access to the brain after injection into the bloodstream. Many studies have shown that these rapalogs can interfere with early neuronal development and they can also throughout life compromise immune functions, which can cause problems for the patients. We, we think that with even after short-term delivery, we'll see a reduction in size of the lesions due to shrinkage of the cells. 
I remember since we would be giving the vector into the bloodstream, it's going to hit all the tissues of the body, including the kidneys. So we expect to see um, improvement of the renal and angiolipomas also. And by giving the many cells in the body an extra copy of the gene, we may provide protection from further loss by of one of the genes by somatic mutation. And this type of treatment can be applied with other available drugs and other clinical treatments. So we're hopeful that this systemic gene replacement of either Hamartin or Tuberin uh, can be effective in restoring uh, neuronal and subependinal morphology. We still don't know yet if it's going to um, reduce epilepsy, but that's being tested now. Um, but we do, we do think we can improve lifespan and reduce some of the complications of the disease. And we want to thank you all. If you have questions, there'll be a format that you can ask them. And here's the, the village that came together to, to get this, move this book forward. I have to say we're initially inspired by a Dr. Teal, who sees these patients and convinced us of the urgency of the situation. Um, Casey McGuire made the AV vectors. Vijaya Ramesh is an expert in the actions of Tuberin and Hamartin. Um, and of course, uh, Shopa Habkar has Prabh Habkar has, has led the effort for a long time, and Edwina Abu Haydar has really filled in recently and carried on a lot of the work. Thank you.